Anyway, welcome again. Um, I know um, many of you are aware of uh, FIG, but I always like to put in a few slides uh, explaining what the International Federation of Surveyors is. FIG was founded 143 years ago in, in Paris, and it's a federation of national associations and is the only international body that represents all surveying disciplines. And remember, it's FIG, not FIG. Fig is a fruit. FIG uh, represents over a quarter of a million surveyors in over 120 countries go around the, around the globe. There are 10 commissions that lead FIG's technical work. Each member association appoints a delegate to each of the commissions. Uh, detailed information on the work of the commissions can be found on the FIG website. Here are the 10 commissions. It, again, it covers all aspects and di disciplines of, of the surveying profession. Also, young surveyors can participate and are encouraged to participate in FIG activities, especially working within the 10 commissions, and that's where all this technical work is done. Um, as many of you know, it is a critical time for FIG and surveyors. The average age globally of the surveyor is 54 years old, and it's even more extreme in North America, where it's now 58 years old. Young surveyors represent the future survivability of the surveying profession, and there's so much open to you. FIG uh, uh, started 20 years ago in 2001. It was endorsed at the second session of the FIG General Assembly, May 11th in Seoul, Korea. And so just a few days ago, uh, we actually celebrated the actual 20th anniversary of the FIG Foundation. The FIG Foundation is an independent body under the International Federation of Surveyors. It's administered by the FIG office in Copenhagen and directed by a board of directors appointed by the FIG council. The purpose, purpose of the foundation is the funding of educational and capacity building projects and scholarships. The foundation raises funds to secure a sustainable future for surveyors. Donations finance educational and capacity building projects and scholarships, especially in developing countries and countries in transition, and encourage research into all disciplines of surveying and help disseminate the results of that research. The focus of the foundation is to build a sustainable future through six directives, including support by seed funding conferences, meetings like this of young surveyors and similar events in cooperation with international agencies, such as the UN. The FIG Foundation has supported Young Surveyors since the establishment of the Young Surveyors Network in 2006, awarding a total of 208 grants over and totaling over 303,000 euros to date. Again, this year, the Young Surveyors celebrate 15 years and the foundation celebrates its 20th anniversary. So it's a really good time to ha have a meeting together. This goes and shows all the uh, Young Surveyor conferences and regional meetings from 2012, where the first one was held in Rome during the FIG Working Week, through um, this year where again, for the second year in a row, we are doing, uh, doing it virtually. Here shows the, the first uh, event that the foundation uh, supported the Young Surveyors Group. It was a Young Surveyors Board Meeting and Future of Surveying Workshop held in Cairo, Egypt in 2007. So 14 years ago, um, that was 
The first meeting uh, that occurred right after the creation of the Young Surveyors Network. Uh, so uh, we're very, very, very happy to be able to uh, support this. And again, it's showing the photo of the uh, FIG Working Week in Hanoi. That, of course, that was the last time we were able to meet in person. Here's a pie chart showing the foundation grants over the years. Uh, as you can see, it's broken down. 36% um, uh, have gone to uh, Africa. I'm not sure why it's not shown over on the side, but 29% to Europe, 26% to Asia Pacific, 6% to uh, South America, and 3% to North America. Here's a distribution of the foundation grants uh, covering 75 countries. Uh, we just added five additional countries this year with the, the grants that we have given for this, uh, this event. And here are the uh, grants from 2002 to 2021. The countries shown in red are the ones that uh, received the grants uh, for this, this year. And again, we've uh, given out a total of 75 grants this year to young surveyors to participate. The foundation proudly supports participation of young surveyors at young surveyor regional meetings. Uh, in addition to the working weeks and congresses, also uh, foundation uh, does uh, make grants for PhD scholarships, academic research, uh, FIG Commission Publication Author Support Grants. We work with the commissions on that. And of course, other worthy activities such as the Volunteer Community Surveyor Program and also the Aubrey Barker FIG Foundation Course Development Grant. Aubrey Barker is a foundation based in the UK. 75 young surveyors, as I mentioned, have received grants to participate and I congratulate each and each of you. And I hope you uh, not only learn something from the Young Surveyors uh, Conference here, but also uh, in June when, when you can participate in the full FIG Working Week. I want to give a big thank you to Cromwell Maldol for helping collect and organize applications for the Six Young Surveyors Conference. Cromwell has done this for a number of years. Um, he just recently said that he doesn't qualify as a young surveyor anymore because he's no longer 35. But to me, you can be a young surveyor at heart. And, you know, heck, I'm a young surveyor. Why not? Here are some photos of some of the activities that have been supported by the foundation uh, around the world. Uh, we have also supported uh, um, annually uh, the International Genetic uh, Students Meeting, in addition to uh, the FIG related surveying activities. Over its first 20 years, 23 people from 14 countries have served on the board. All have generously served as volunteers receiving no compensation for their time and activities on the board. The first foundation board uh, is shown here, uh, Hoger Magel in Germany. It's president, uh, Stig Enemark from Denmark, uh, who later became FIG president. Uh, Ian Greenway from Ireland, myself, and Ian Williamson from Australia. And 20 years later, um, I'm serving as president. Winston, Mike, Enrico, and Jijan are uh, serving as directors. I would also like to point out and thank Trimble. Uh, Trimble is our charter partner and has contributed 160,000 euros in contributions to the foundation since 2002. So we very much appreciate their dedicated uh, partnership. The foundation is proud to facilitate the publication of an important collection of books on history of surveying. It's a really good way to celebrate our 20th anniversary and it's with the generous financial support of, of Tribble. 
35 years of extensive research by Jan de Grave and Jim Smith, director and honorary secretary of the International Institution for History of Surveying and Measurement, which is a permanent institution in FIG, has resulted in two sets of important publications on the history of surveying and measurement. The books cover 2,760 years in seven volumes, totaling 3,000 pages with over 350 historical pictures. The uh, first is a five volume set titled Notes on the History of Determining the Shape and Size of the Earth Using the Meridian Arc. And the second set of two books, uh, are, which are related, are entitled The Meridian Arcs in the East and Southern Africa with emphasis on the arc of the 30th meridian. That's a mouthful. And connection with the Struve geodetic arc and the arc of the 30th meridian. A special edition of 100 sets of these seven books will be published this summer. More information will be available soon. And this should be very of interest to not only um, surveyors, but libraries, uh, anybody, especially who's interested in any type of geodetic activity uh, globally. And again, upcoming conferences, uh, FIG. Hopefully next year we can meet finally again in person at the FIG Congress in Cape Town. And the following year it will be the FIG Working Week here in the United States in Orlando, Florida. Thank you very much and I wish you all the best for a very successful conference. Thank you. Thank you, John. Um, I, next up on the agenda, we have Kwabena Asiyama and Farah Kuxel uh, from the FIG Young Surveyors Network. And Farah, I thought you were going to take that uh, speech here. Yes, may I get help with the presentation, please? Thank you very much. Again, my name is Farah Pulanta Kuxel. I'm the vice chair of the FIG Young Surveys Network. I hope you all are well. Um, after the, our first virtual event that was held last year, we are happy to have the sixth Young Surveys Conference in four different regions. Uh, we can go to the next one. Uh, this conference is being held prior to the FIG eWorking Week that will be held between 20th and 25th of June by, by the Netherlands. After this event, you can all attend the eWorking Week uh, you can also take part at Young Survey session during Working Week. Uh, you can check our social media accounts for that. Mm -hmm. And I would like to introduce you our FIG Young Surveys Administration and local representative of the event. Uh, the chair of the FIG YSN is Kobena Obank Asiyama, and he is a lecturer at Leibniz University of Hanover. Jacob Hack is who is a Great Lakes Regional Geodetic Advisor at NOAA. National Geodetic Survey from North American Network, and there's also me. The definition of being a young surveyor is that survey is aged 35 or under, or the young professionals uh, graduated from a bachelor or master's degree within 10 years. Mm -hmm. And to be an active young surveyor, first, you can follow our social media accounts to hear the recent news about the network. You can get in contact with your FIG member national association and let them know that you're interested in being active. And of course, uh, you can attend or organize the meetings. You can share your ideas with us if you're interested. Uh, we will be more than happy to welcome uh, new young surveyors. And uh, this was a, and um, we see the five different regions uh, that we mentioned earlier in this, um, in the slides. Can you go to the next one, please? Okay. Um, this was a really short summary of our network. Uh, I would like to thank uh, organizers, um, all of the organizers who helped this event to happen, of course, Big thanks to the, all of the participants and speakers here. 
Uh, I also want to mention that you can use FIG 6 uh, YSC and FIG YSM uh, hashtags if you're going to use post something on social media and tag our accounts uh, over there. And now I would like to invite Jacob. Thank you very much. Okay, Th thank you, Farah. And uh, yeah, I just want to give a put a little bit of perspective here that this this is an around the world event. So many of us have been up since uh, uh, quite a few hours ago, going through the different regions. And and um, there, after the North America event, there's uh, an Asia Pacific event uh, later tonight in in the North American time frame. Uh, and I, I encourage you to, to attend that as well. It's a great way to go out and get a, a different perspective and to see what surveying is going on in different parts of the world. Now I'll, I'll invite uh, Denver Winchester, the president of the NSPS Young Surveyors Network to uh, give a few remarks. I assume everybody can still hear me. Yes. Okay. Um, first of all, I want to thank everybody for coming to the sixth Young Surveyors Conference. Um, seems like everybody has an anniversary right now. We've got 15, 20, and we're your, we just passed our seventh year. Um, I'm the current president of the NSPS uh, Young Surveyors Network. Um, Jacob is also an officer, and James, who you will see in other sessions. Um, we are the United States overarching structure for the individual state societies. Um, so we're just, you know, like a central database for reaching out to your local groups and trying to maintain organization. Um, we are about, I think we have about 43 of the 50 states and I think we have two territories that are represented. Um, I think we have dealt well with this remote status and. Um, a lot of the people I'm seeing on the chat were in this meeting last year. Um, I'm happy to see that you guys are back in this meeting. Seems like they have a, a really good set of speakers and events for you to, to reach out to. And I encourage anybody to go to any of the other sessions as well. Like Jacob said, it is a very interesting, um, we don't get out of our, you know, our regions at all really. So seeing what people go through in other parts of the world is really eye-opening. Um, I don't really have a whole lot to say. Um, I wanna thank you know John and Jacob and Farah and everybody for putting this together um, and allowing us to be a part of it. Um, I guess if anybody is here from the United States and you don't know what you're supposed to be doing or what you need, then I would just ask that you reach out to me and um, I'll get you where you're going and I wish that Everybody has an excellent session, and you guys learned something today. It's really all I got. Thank you, Denver. Um, and and again, welcome. We're we're all here. We're uh, um, happy to be here, learning about surveying around the world. Now we have two keynotes lined up. Uh, the first one is from uh, Ms. Juliana Blackwell, the director of the U.S. National Geodetic Survey. Uh, Juliana couldn't be here uh, today in person, but she sent video remarks that I'll, I'll play here in a minute. Um, Juliana Blackwell is the director of the National Geodetic Survey. As director, she is responsible for the financial, administrative, and programmatic performance of NGS, the lead federal agency for positioning activities in the United States. She oversees the management and delivery of the National Spatial Reference System, the consistent coordinate system for latitude, longitude, height, scale, gravity, orientation, and shoreline information throughout the United States. So let me be. Greetings, young surveyors. It's an honor to speak to you today during your conference. I commend you for your dedication to your profession and your commitment to your own personal development. I'm sorry I couldn't join you live today, but I'm on my way home from my son's college graduation ceremony. As a newly minted young engineer, he too is facing the new reality of starting his professional journey in uncharted territory. And in a world that has changed dramatically over the past year, 
While the challenges and changes we face globally and locally loom large, there's never been a greater opportunity to leverage knowledge, technology, and community to make our world a better place. My goal today is to motivate you, whether you're a student, a young professional, or a seasoned survey professional, to think of mentoring as a means to navigate through changes in your life and as a tool to position yourself for success and fulfillment throughout your career. Mentoring, what is it? What does it mean to you? Well, here's how I'll define mentoring or mentorship. It's a relationship designed to support the personal and the professional growth and development of an individual. That's the mentee. This is done through the guidance, the influence, and the knowledge of a more experienced individual, the mentor. An essential element of mentoring is that for a mentoring relationship to be successful, it must be based on mutual respect, trust, and commitment between the mentor and the mentee and be equally supported by two-way communication and confidentiality. Before I talk about the mentoring initiatives I've been involved in, I'd like to do a quick recap of my mentoring journey. I'll confess that as I started out in my professional career, I benefited from mentoring even before I knew what mentoring was. I remember on the first day of my job hunting right after I got out of college, I was offered a secretarial position with the federal government working for the U.S. Public Health Service. I was a pre-med student and math major in college, and I knew I wanted a career where I could apply my math and science background. I decided to accept the secretarial position, and I started the job within a week. I know it was not my dream job, but it was just the beginning of my journey, and it also offered health insurance and a retirement plan. As I learned the ropes of my administrative support position, the health, services, health service professionals in my office that I worked with took note of my skills, my career goals, and they took me under their wing. They offered advice on which offices hired mathematicians, and they taught me how to search for job opportunities in my field of study. And one day, one of my informal mentor coworkers introduced me to a friend who worked for this scientific agency called NOAA the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration. This is the agency I work for to this day, 30 years later. Well, I didn't really think about mentoring at the time. As I look back, I see that I was being informally mentored by a small group of professionals who wanted to help me realize my full potential and be happy with my career choices. Throughout my career with NOAA, I've been fortunate to have a few special mentors who supported my career development and encouraged me to reach for goals I wasn't sure I was ready for. They challenged me with assignments, provided public speaking advice, encouraged me when I was down, and helped me find the perfect graduate program which allowed me to balance my workload and my family life. Thanks to their support, I navigated my way from an entry-level scientist to the senior executive position I serve in today as the director of the National Genetic Survey at NOAA. I know now that the guidance and support from these informal mentors made all the difference in my career and in my personal development. One of the greatest aspects of mentoring as a career development tool is that it exists on many levels and mentoring opportunities exist throughout a lifetime. Another great aspect of mentoring is that it's open to everyone, whether you're a student, a young professional, in the middle of your career, or a seasoned veteran. There are mentoring opportunities waiting for and available to you. There is one caveat though, and that is for a mentoring uh, relationship to be successful, the mentee must be fully committed to accepting the advice and the constructive feedback and must be willing to take action We'll use a little analogy. Mentors can list the ingredients and suggest a recipe, but it's up to the mentee to do the prep work, follow the recipe, and carefully monitoring the cooking process to end up with a great meal. Mentoring also has many different formats, which vary based on formality and time commitment. Mentoring offers something for everyone, 
There are formal mentoring and informal mentoring relationships. Formal mentoring allows uh, protocols to be used to achieve the desired outcome. Informal mentoring also plays an important role in empl employees' personal growth and career development. Mentorships can be long-term relationships sustained over the length of a person's career, or they can be short-term and extend over a course of a few months or years. There are also situational mentoring situations that help a mentee uh, resolve a situation, resolve, solve a problem, or make a key decision in a relatively short amount of time. Mentoring can take place in person or virtually, or a combination of the two. Mentors can be colleagues, professors, supervisors, friends, or family members, perhaps even all of these over the course of a career or a lifetime. While there are more informal mentorships than formal ones, I think both are important to employees and organizations positioning themselves for success. I am a strong advocate of organizations, especially larger ones, providing formal mentoring programs for their workforce. Why? Because mentoring programs show a commitment by the organization to develop the most valuable asset of an organization, its people. I'd like to share with you a couple of examples of formal mentoring programs we have at NOAA. I'll start with an example from my office, the National Geodetic Survey. Years ago, I wanted to position new employees for success, beginning with their first day on the job. To ensure the successful transition of a newly hired employee into the NGS work environment, I started a new hire mentoring program back in 2012. Under the new hire mentoring program, we assign every new employee, an experienced NGS employee, who is not his or her supervisor, to serve as their mentor during the first six months on the job. We found that a successful transition into NGS includes not only learning about specific work assignments, but also learning about our culture, history, and the many intangibles that make up the work environment. While supervisors and direct coworkers still provide assignment specific guidance, the NGS new hire mentor assists with providing the new employee with information and perspectives about the organization as a whole, including those things new employees may wanna know but are reluctant to ask their supervisor, such as trying to decipher the office acronyms and learning the lingo, learning who's who in the organization, navigating the chain of command, knowing what the unwritten rules are, and finding out where the best places are to eat lunch. I have a second example, which is a pilot project which led to the establishment of the NOAA-wide formal mentoring program in 2018. Using the NGS New Hire mentoring program as the point of beginning, in 2017, I championed the launch of a formal mentoring pilot project within NOAA to develop and test a formal mentoring process and to provide data to measure its success. Knowing how important standards and specifications are in the field of surveying, I wanted to make sure we held the mentoring pilot project to standards and ensure participants received a quality experience. One of the first things I focused on was creating a pool of mentors to support the pilot program. This included provided training and practice mentoring sessions to those who were interested in serving as mentors in the pilot project. We hired a training consultant with expertise in mentoring to train 40 individuals and prepare them for their mentoring journey. We then brought in a company with an established mentoring program and online portal to coordinate and manage the other aspects of a formal mentoring pilot project. The goals of the NOAA Mentoring Pilot Project were to provide employees with professional growth and career development opportunities and to develop a new generation of leaders within the organization. More specifically, we sought to increase employee job satisfaction and job fit, help new employees learn and transition into the organization, provide a leadership development program, and develop the pool of future leaders. I'll briefly describe the components of a formal mentoring program. First, there's a process to assess participants and match mentees with mentors. There's formal training on mentoring that's provided for both roles. There's an established tracking system. And there are clearly defined goals for measuring success. 
Typically, there's also a coordinator who's available to help struggling partnerships overcome obstacles and troubleshoot problems and challenges. The mentor and the mentee pairs spent about two hours a month on mentoring activities over the course of nine months in the pilot project. There were optional forums and special topic sessions that were used as a means to provide the mentoring cohort additional support and opportunities to connect as a group. The mentee and mentor pairs established a joint formal agreement documenting how they would work together and to commit to a respectful and confidential working relationship. The mentee, with assistance from the mentor, developed a mentoring action plan based on a joint assessment of the mentee's developmental needs. These mentoring action plans included learning activities such as developmental assignments, shadowing opportunities, hosting brown bags, volunteering for a new working group or a committee, identifying and completing training courses, and undergoing assessments to better gauge professional interests and strengths. One other popular activity was the stretch assignment. With support from the mentor, the mentee sought a challenging assignment outside of their comfort zone, such as joining Toastmasters, leading a cross-functional team, or organizing a learning or an outreach event. Often the mentors guided and encouraged the mentees to engage in new and diverse networking opportunities to help the mentees develop relationships, to gain exposure, and to increase, increase their visibility throughout the organization. Mentees were also encouraged to attend higher level leadership meetings, conduct informational interviews with senior leaders or external partners, and to attend NOAA sponsored social events to expand their perspectives. I should also mention that while the mentees were encouraged to share their mentoring action plans with their supervisors, the supervisors were not involved in the mentoring discussions unless the mentee specifically wanted to include them. Resources, including assessment tools, online resources, and mentoring forums rounded out the formal mentoring program offerings. The established start and end of the nine-month mentoring commitment also included a midpoint and an end of program celebration and evaluation. While the mentoring pilot project was designed to support the career growth of the mentees, we learned that the mentors also benefited. In addition to mentors having the opportunity to leave their legacy and build the next generation of leaders at NOAA, those who served as mentors highlighted other benefits of being a mentor, which include giving back. Many of the mentors mentioned how much they benefited from mentoring during their careers from their mentoring during their careers and how good it felt to help others and to make a difference. Another positive highlight was that they got a chance to meet new people and learn new things. NOAA has over 11,000 employees who support numerous scientific and public service activities. Mentors also developed a deeper understanding and appreciation of the challenges in the workplace today, including balancing work and family life, and the effects social and racial injustice have on employees. On a larger scale, mentoring programs increase employee engagement, improve job satisfaction, support career development, and provide opportunities for employees to find their niche in the organization, and to build strategic relationships and gain a broader perspective of the organization's mission and future. What were the expected outcomes of this mentoring pilot and did it succeed? Well, for the individuals, they were able to successfully identify individual career and professional development goals, participate in developmental opportunities to hone identified skills, expand their understanding of organizational values, mission, and culture, and network to increase exposure and access to leadership and programs at different levels throughout the organization. What about the organization? Well, based on the feedback and evaluations, the pilot project demonstrated that a formal mentoring program at NOAA would help build and retain a well-rounded cadre of employees reflective of workforce diversity, support and encourage career growth and professional development, develop a sense of connection and employee engagement, and enhance communication, innovation, and partnership building. I'm happy to say that the Mentoring Pilot Project led to the establishment of the NOAA Mentoring Program in 2018. There's other, one other type of mentoring I'd like to highlight, especially to this fine group of dedicated young surveyors. 
and that is reverse mentoring. In contrast to the typical mentoring relationship in which the mentor is often senior to the mentee, in reverse mentoring, younger employees serve as the mentors to more senior member, uh, senior member teammates, and they mentor them on various topics of strategic and cultural relevance, generational differences, and evolving technologies. You just look at the past year and how we've had to adapt to new ways of working virtually and how quickly the younger generation not only adapted but excelled while those who are less tech savvy and more accustomed to working in a controlled office environment had a greater learning curve to adapt to. As a result of working remotely, many of us now embrace more modern technology, flexible work schedules and collaboration style second nature to younger generations. More than ever, we're learning from our junior colleagues and our kids, especially those who help us with these types of presentations, uh, and I hope that reverse mentoring grows in popularity and brings the younger and, and the seasoned professionals closer together in the workplace. Just like in normal mentoring, the same tenets of trust, respect, confidentiality, and commitment are paramount to the success of reverse mentoring relationships. What better way is there for an organization to grow new leaders and affect organizational growth than to have junior members directly engage with senior staff? This interaction influences the culture and goals of an organization and promotes the retention of younger professionals, those who are adapting to change and preparing to lead us into the future. In closing, wherever you are on your journey, whether you're finishing up school, looking for your first job, transitioning into a new organization, seeking career advancement, stepping into your first supervisory role, or looking to start your own company, mentoring can help you position yourself for success. And when you're in an executive or leadership position and are looking to develop the next generation of leaders, improve the diversity and inclusion of your organization, or ensure legacy planning, mentoring can position you and your organization for a successful and sustainable future. I encourage you to utilize the resources available through the FIG Young Servers Network, the FIG organization, your school, work, community, friends, and family to nurture mentorships and to help you achieve your professional and personal goals, to build your professional network and to enhance your skills and knowledge. I wish you all the best and I thank you for the opportunity to speak to you today. I hope you have a productive conference. Thank you. Um, so we're, that, that was Juliana Blackwell, director of the National Geodetic Survey, um, talking about one of the great, uh, one of the big items that we're, we're trying to focus on today, uh, sustainability, sustainability within a career, sustainability within the environment. Um, and, and, and along with that goes to how, how do we uh, adapt for crisis, react to crisis, and be prepared for any big chal major challenges coming our way. Uh, so next up, we have Jordan Lauver. He's the, the lead of the Trimble Field Construction AR, MR, VR uh, division. <clears throat> so Jordan has led uh, this for, for the previous five years, overseeing the development, release, marketing, and sales for tools such as the Trimble XR10 and, and ho with HoloLens 2. Uh, Trimble Connect for HoloLens and Trimble Sight Vision. Prior to his work in extended reality, Jordan spent two years in Trimble's leadership development program, worked on NASA's Mars rover and LRO programs, and received engineering degrees in computer vision, photogrammetry, and surveying from the Ohio State University. And I think we actually overlapped there for a little bit in those and in, in, um, the the geodetic side. Um, so I'll bring Jordan up here and we'll get him speaking. So I see you now, Jordan. Can hey, we hear you? you? I can hear you. you. I cool. can. We're, we're two out of three. Let me, uh, let me go ahead and present and see if we can do three out of three. You got that? And I see a web browser right now that's got some slides in it. And now I see a slide. You're got good. It. All right, cool. Thank you very much, Jacob, for the introduction. And that's that's a great segue coming off of Juliana's talk. I like the idea of kind of the reverse mentoring and how you know older, more experienced folks can 
also be learning from from kind of the younger generation coming up. I, you know, I think that's a a good segue into kind of what what I wanted to spend a few minutes talking about today, which is, you know, the idea of adapting to crisis, which is obviously quite topical at the moment, um, <clears throat> but with specific emphasis on innovation and how innovation and, and technology can help us, uh, you know, react and adapt to crisis. Um, so <clears throat> Jacob kind of gave a bit of a primer, but just a, a quick bio on myself. So. Uh, my name is Jordan Lover. I, I oversee the uh, XR Technology Innovation Center um, at Trimble, so overseeing uh, products uh, related to augmented, mixed, and virtual reality um, targeted at your traditional Trimble customers. Um, I grew up in Ohio. I'm in rural Ohio in a construction family. Um, my dad and my uncles were all kind of in a family business, do, uh, you know, building new houses. Um, my dad, in particular, was the plumber, um, and so I grew up uh, throughout my teenage years working the summers with my dad, uh, putting plumbing into new homes. Um, after I graduated high school in Northeast Ohio, I moved to Columbus and attended Ohio State. Um, I bounced around between a few majors uh, for a while. Um, and ended up landing in geomatics engineering. Um, so I got a geomatics uh, bachelor's. And then as I was finishing up my bachelor's, um, I was working for a professor at Ohio State who really sparked an interest in me uh, in computer vision and photogrammetry specifically. Um, I really loved this idea that we could teach computers to see and understand the world in the same way as humans do, um, and thus be able to leverage computers to uh, to help us in our daily lives, whether that's personal life or in our work lives. Um, so I went on to get my master's in computer vision and photogrammetry at, at OSU, um, where I did some research on some NASA and, and Air Force and DoD projects as well. Um, and then in 2013, uh, I graduated and I moved to Denver um, and I joined Trimble in their leadership development program. So very similar to what Juliana was talking about. Uh, at NGS, um, you know, I spent my first two years at Trimble in a rotation program where um, I spent two years rotating uh, through different full-time jobs uh, within different divisions in the company and really use that opportunity to kind of acquire this breadth of knowledge and build a, build a network um, and learn a bunch of different skills um, that, that, you know, have, have you know, e even some of the most minor side projects that I did um, have turned out to help me now in my primary position uh, at Trimble. And so in, in 2015, as I was finishing up that rotation program, um, it corresponded uh, right in line with us announcing a partnership with Microsoft around mixed reality and around Microsoft HoloLens. Um, and so we built this kind of innovation division within the company um, that was purely focused on the latest and greatest innovation tech and how we could go apply it to our customers' industries. And so I've stuck with that um, for about six years now um, and have really enjoyed kind of taking this, this idea of, you know, can we start with a technology and attach that to a customer problem and actually go make a difference uh, out in an industry? And so I'll, I'll start with a quote. You know, I've I've said this many times myself, and it's a bit of a buzzword out in industry to talk about disruptive innovation. This idea that innovation is, a, you know, kind of can be a destructive force, and it can kind of come in and blow things up. Um, and I ran across this quote just recently in a book that I'm reading, and it really changed my perspective on innovation. You know, and it, it, it essentially says that you know. Innovation by its nature is not disruptive. It's actually a bit of a misnomer. Um, it is essential and vital and a fundamentally positive force for good. Um, the only people to whom innovation is disruptive are those who have been left behind by it, those who have failed to adapt and themselves innovate um, and thus have been left behind. You know, what what goes along with this quote is this idea of uh, you know a a fundamental requirement um you know there's there's certain things in life that we will always need you know use the example of humans need to travel you know if you go all the way back to the beginning of man you know they 
we invented shoes and then we invented the wheel and then the horse-drawn carriage and then the automobile and the steamship and the airplane and electric vehicles, etc. That is innovation. The requirement has not changed. It's a fundamental, essential requirement of man. Um, and what you have seen along the way is the innovation as new technology comes in and allows you to do things better. And the only person that that innovation was disruptive to uh, was the guy who was still building horse-drawn carriages after the automobile came out. Um, so if you look specifically to the customer and to the market, innovation is this kind of fundamental force for good. So when I think about innovation, you know, I, I see it as kind of four, four stages that make up an innovation. Um, for the first, I'll, I'll talk for a second about Trimble. Um, you know, I, I imagine that everyone on the call is familiar with Trimble, at least, you know, our, our products, GPS, total stations, et cetera. But what you might not be familiar with is kind of the mission, the purpose of why Trimble exists and, and why we all show up to work every day. And our mission is to transform the way the world works. You know, Trimble has our focused industries in agriculture and survey, construction, et cetera. And we recognize these you know, essential or fundamental requirements of those industries. You, you know, those requirements will never go away. You always need to plow a field or build a building or go survey a plot of land. So we take it upon ourselves to be that force of innovation. Um, you know, in our case, we innovate in those industries by connecting the digital and the physical worlds. So when I think about innovation, the first piece I think about is the purpose. Why do you innovate? Where is your focus? And what are those kind of fundamental requirements that you look to solve? And so the next stage is the problem. You know, once you get into one of those industries, and for the sake of this presentation, I'll talk about construction a little bit. And you know, once you get into one of those industries, what are those requirements? What are the problems that you're trying to solve? What are the, the pain points uh, that people in that industry have? Um, construction is usually bottom one or bottom two um, in reports that come out as the most tech backward and inefficient industry on earth. Um, and, you know, it's, it's trying, but it's still pretty bad. Um, and so, you know, there's tons of statistics out there about, you know, how many projects exceed budget or exceed their schedules, et cetera. The one I call, I call out and I highlight here is that the average profit margin on a construction project, whether it's a $100,000 project or a $100 million project, is about 4%. Um, so when it comes to profit margins in industries, that's about as tight as you can play it. Like they're really skating by, you know, by the skin of their teeth, so to speak. And so if you imagine a scenario, let's just think hypothetically for, for a moment that a global pandemic would happen, um, there's not a whole lot of room for error there. There's not a whole lot of room for, you know, construction management issues or outside forces that come in. And when you're running with such a tight margin, um, any external force like that, any, you know, uncontrollable issue um, can be enough to put you under and to put you out of work. So this is kind of the second piece being, you know, what is the problem? What is it that you're out there actually trying to solve with innovation? And with the third piece comes the invention. Um, there's, a, there's a distinction between an invention and an innovation. Um, I'll use the example here. Uh, it's, a, it's a great photo. It's one of my favorites uh, of a Trimble team in Christchurch, New Zealand in 1997, where we actually patented one of the first augmented reality headsets. You can see a Trimble GNSS receiver on the back there. Um, and, you know, these engineers, when they were, when they did this invention and they filed a patent for it, they saw the survey in the construction industry. They had a purpose. They saw a problem. That problem was surveyors and construction workers have data, but they can't visualize it. They can't see it in the context of their environment. And so they invented something to go solve that problem. They said, well, what if we built a headset that when you look through it, it would overlay digital content on the physical world? And they're like, man, we're really on to something. And they went and they proved went and proofed it and did a prototype and they patented it. 
And what they found was that distinction between an innovation and an invention, where an invention demonstrates that an idea can work. It's a proof of concept that you can go solve a problem. Whereas an innovation actually allows it to go be put to work. So it's a scale. It's I'm taking my invention and I'm now growing it and I'm building the infrastructure and the value network under that invention such that others can benefit from my invention. In this case, that others would be able to go and buy a system like this and leverage it to make a difference and so help solve those problems that I talked about. So that's then the fourth piece being innovation. And so this slide um, shows an, an example of some of the innovative, some of the more innovative solutions that, that I oversee at Trimble. Um, and, you know, I'll make some distinctions here. You know, if you look at the far left side, you'll see uh, tools that you know, you're very familiar with total stations and GPS receivers. Um, an innovation can just be a new application for technology. So if you think about the history of Trimble and you go back to 1978, when Charlie Trimble founded our company, what he saw was an opportunity to take technology that to date was a military technology and go apply it to other industries. So he saw an invention that could be innovated on to go solve a problem in construction and surveying and agriculture and offshore oil, dr uh, offshore oil drilling. And so that was an example of an innovation. More modern, you'll see, you know, in the second piece there, um, we have a partnership with Boston Dynamics where we started integrating uh, 3D laser scanners on top of autonomous robotic dogs. Um, this might sound very futuristic, but we have customers who are using this today. It's a great example of an innovation where there's nothing new about a 3D laser scanner. The patents that we have for 3D laser scanners are probably 50 years old, but it is innovative to take that laser scanner and say, how can we enhance this? Can we put it on top of an autonomous robotic dog and let it go walk a construction site? So. That's kind of how I would define and frame the idea of innovation and how we can think with an innovative brain of how can we take what we know and this pool of knowledge to make the next step and always be kind of on the cutting edge and on this forefront of how we think about how we solve the biggest problems that exist in our industries today. So I guess the next question is, you know, why is innovation important? Why should we talk about innovation? Why should we have such a heavy focus on it? And for this, I'll, I'll use kind of an analogy to an airplane and, and how an airplane flies, or, or I guess the, the fundamental forces that act on an airplane. Um, you know, when I talked about construction and this 4% profit margin, ultimately that profit margin is just the subtraction of a push and a pull. It is, all the things you try to do right minus all the things you're likely doing wrong. You know, I'm training my employees, I'm deploying technology, I have good process, I'm finding good prices on materials, et cetera, et cetera. Minus all the project inefficiency and the rework and the poor process and the staffing issues and anything else that's going to drag that profit margin down. And so often when we go and we talk to construction companies, this is the formula at a very, very basic level of what they're thinking about is how can I get one step ahead? How can I make that 4% margin go to a 5% margin or make sure that I feel confident that I'm going to get that 4% margin? These are the things that a construction company can control about their own business and that they can prepare for. What often gets overlooked is that there's two other forces that act on that plane. There's lift and there's weight. And these are the macro forces, the things that we can't control, but we can prepare for them. So if we think of examples of lift, there's a lot of them out there right now. If you look at the construction industry and all of its related industries, such as surveying, like the economy is doing quite well, especially if you look at construction, there's a ton of money in construction right now. There's a housing boom. Uh, you know, there's talk of an in infrastructure bill, interest rates are super low, et cetera. Those are examples of lift. But on the flip side, there's always weight as well. There's things like the COVID-19 pandemic coming out of nowhere and just slapping you in the face. Things that you can't control, but are going to heavily impact you. And when I think of 
innovation, I see it as a way to shore up defenses for these forces as well. It's not just a matter of this drag and thrust push and pull of the business, but also a way to build your defense for you to be more adaptable and, re and ready to adapt when these outward forces come, because they inevitably will come. And I think, you know, the other piece that, that I would say here is, you know, thinking of my experience and what I've seen through construction specifically in the last year and a half during COVID, um, by the time the wait comes, by the time the pandemic hits or you know, the labor shortages happen or your supply chain gets disrupted, it's already too late. If, you are, if you've put yourself in a position to adapt, you'll adapt. But if you wait until the issue happens and then you wake up and you say, oh, we need to start thinking about this innovative technology that uh, will help us adapt to this crisis, you're already too late because it's you know it's you're already in the mess and adapt adaptation is something that has to happen quickly, and so I'll use a, a couple of examples of some of the biggest issues that I saw in construction over the last year or so. Um, they're going to be pretty straightforward, but I think they give really good examples of how companies who are really on the cutting edge and on the innovation you know further up on the innovation curve. Uh, really were able to adapt to that crisis better than others. So, so for a couple examples, you know, we'll look at the one on the left first. You know, one of the biggest issues with COVID was we weren't able to travel. And travel is such an essential force in, in all heavy industry. It's this idea that especially in an industry like construction, where you have an aging workforce and a lot of your kind of tribal knowledge uh, is, is usually, you know, a couple people higher up in the ranks of an organization, you get this, this concept of the subject matter expert, where if there's, you know, very specific issues on a construction site or a piece of machinery goes down, um, there's one guy that you call and he drives to site or he flies to site and he solves an issue. And every minute that that machine is down, you're, you're hemorrhaging money and you're thus hemorrhaging that profit margin. And so when COVID happened, people couldn't travel anymore. And so there were these huge issues of just construction sites sitting empty and just coming to an absolute halt because there would be an issue that needed solved, but nobody there to solve it. Well, some of our customers, I'll use John's Manville on um, the East Coast as a great example, um, they already had a solution for this. They were using mixed reality. They were using that heads up display to do remote collaboration. And so for customers who are using this technology pre-pandemic or now, it gave them the ability to call in and phone a friend, that remote expert, so that he could see what you were seeing through this device. He could annotate on your world and he could walk you through solving that issue even if he was in a different state sitting on his couch, unable to come to that job site. So our customers who were heavily invested in you know, this remote collaboration technology, as soon as COVID hit, they came back and they bought more. They knew what they had. They knew that they were at the forefront of that innovation curve and they came and they doubled down because they knew it was something that was going to help them adapt to this crisis and get through it. The second one was this idea of you know, worker shortages and the reduced capacity allowed on site. Again, empty job sites because you just, you know, in some areas you weren't allowed to have any more than 20 people on a job site or they had to be socially distanced. You know, it doesn't play very well for a job site where you normally have three, 400 people on a site doing all types of different tasks. And so companies like Hensel Phelps, you know, this is a photo from uh, the Denver International Airport project. Um, where they deployed spot robots to do their laser scanning for them. So rather than having to have people on site with the, you know, the risk of them potentially sharing COVID to each other or you know, them getting in trouble with the government because there's too many people on site or with OSHA, they deployed the robots instead. And they went through and they were doing their laser scanning autonomously on the site. And for a third example, you know, there's this one that I think no one was really truly prepared for, which is this incredible logistics effort of worker safety. You know, overnight, you need to make sure that your workers are wearing masks and you need to do temperature checks when they come to site. And you need to do contact tracing to make sure that if someone on site gets sick, you know who they've interacted with. And most companies didn't have any infrastructure for this. And most of them dealt with this in a very bad way where they would 
you know, I'm sure everyone read news stories about factories and construction sites shutting down because every single person on the site caught COVID. Well, Trimble and, and other companies like ours, you know, we sell technology for asset tracking and human worker tracking on a site. Um, it's a little RFID sticker that goes on someone's hard hat. And when they move through that construction site, construction site, it shows you who, when, and where they are on that site. And so imagine if you were already using this solution, you're already kind of on this in innovation technology side of construction. Overnight, these requirements came down for COVID. You already have a system in place that if someone came down with COVID, you knew where they were on the site and when they were on site and who they interacted with because you have this worker tracking and you're already much better suited to be able to adapt to this crisis because you already had the infrastructure in place and the tools in place to do that adaptation. So with that, for my last slide, you know, I'll kind of raise it up to, to a high point being, you know, what's next? You know, when we think of these, these lifts and weights, these fundamental macro forces that uh, oftentimes we can't control, but we can prepare for, you know, I talked about the COVID pandemic and how, you know, when you get this weight, you want to make sure that, you know, you have the right, uh, you know, the right culture and the right innovative mind to, to be able to get through it. Well, you know, what do you do in the other times? What do you do when life gives you tailwinds? So, you know, whether we're looking at the construction sector and, you know, I talked about it, you know, starting to see this upward trend with infrastructure bills and green energy, you know, it's an analogy that can be made to anything. It could be any industry or it could be you as a person. You know, what do you do when times are good? Well, you recognize that they won't always be good. There's always something. It's a cyclical cycle. There's always something. And the best thing that we can do is diverse, diversify ourselves, you know, similar to uh, Juliana talking about mentorship programs and leadership programs where we can ensure that we're getting varied experiences and we're diversifying our skill set and, and our knowledge base. You know, if you think of a construction company, even if they weren't deploying these solutions, just being aware of them, right? Many construction companies, they're so focused on the job to be done that they never take a, and, uh, take a step back and look at the broader ecosystem and say, you know, what should we be planning for a year from now? What happens if there's a pandemic? What happens if there's a housing crash? And those who did take that step back and learn about what's out there, those who took another step back and said, let's actually go do it. Let's make sure that we have a focus and an investment in innovation. They're the ones that will be most robust to the weight when it comes to the, to the crisis. Um, so, you know, I think when, when you think about, you know, like Juliana said, regardless of where you are in your career, whether you're in school or, you know, you're starting a new business um, or, or, or any of the other examples that she made, you know, it, it, I really like to frame innovation as kind of this, this focus that everyone should make sure that they have some kind of their brain that's focused on innovation and what's next um, so they can stay, uh, stay one step ahead uh, when ultimately, you know, life, life takes the tailwinds away and, and gives you some, some headwinds. So with that, I'll, uh, I'll finish up and, and thank you. And uh, Jacob, I'm not sure where we're at on time because I've got my screen up, but if there are any questions, I'll, uh, I'll be happy to take them. I don't see any questions in the chat yet, um, but if you do have questions, I would say hold them for after this next session when we all come back together into the same room and, and we can have a discussion with all of the